This video was sponsored by Hone Health. Well, hey, welcome to another video. This week, we are not building a coffee table. Let me be clear. Anybody can build a coffee table. This week, we are building something completely different. We're building a whiskey table. That's right, a table just for whiskey. So follow along, see how I did it, check the video description for links to products and tools and that sort of thing, and newsflash, there's a link in the video description to our Patreon page. I have completely redone Patreon for this year, making it way more beneficial to you, the viewer. Now you can watch all the YouTube videos completely ad-free. There's live weekly question and answer sessions, so you can ask me any questions you want. There's a ton of behind the scenes footage, so yeah, go sign up for Patreon, link below. You won't regret it. But most importantly, grab yourself a glass of whiskey, enjoy the video, cheers. Now, we're gonna be building this table out of a whole smorgasbord of walnut. Some three quarter, some six quarter. That's gonna be for the legs. You know, the legs of the coffee table, that is. And then this big beefy chunk of eight quarter right here. That's gonna make up our little end caps. So we're gonna start with those first. Now when I say end caps, I mean this piece right here. This curved, beefy, round, well, end cap. Now, I say we're gonna start with that, but what we're really gonna start by doing is just gluing a whole bunch of stuff together so we have pieces to work from. So first, I cut down the eight quarter into manageable little chunks. I run it through the joiner, both on the edge and on the face to get a nice square surface. And then I finish it off on the, oh, hi, over on the planer. Once they're all cleaned up and square, I slap them together in a nice big block. Now I made this block big enough that I can actually get both end caps out of this one piece. So with that in clamps and waiting for it to dry, I decided to start working on the top and bottom of the cabinet body itself. So back over to the table saw, I ripped down some of that three quarter walnut. Now normally I like to use four quarter so that I can run it through the joiner and get it all square, but the wood store didn't have any. So I had to get three quarter which meant the boards had a little wonk to them. So to eliminate this, I decided to throw some dominoes in between each board to help with the alignment and the gluing up process. So I did my top piece and then did the same thing to my bottom piece. Once my dominoes were all drilled out, I slathered some glue in all the appropriate cracks and crevices, smeared it around with my finger and started stacking boards, one on top of the other on top of the other. Once everything was stacked and glued, I stuck it in clamps and then, well, I did the exact same thing all over again to my other panel. And once I got that in clamps, it was time to move on to phase three, or as I like to call it, the leg phase. Making these bad boys, ooh, oh yeah. Okay, that's enough. Now, this is gonna get a little tricky and might be confusing, so just try and follow along the best you can. I hate math. I don't wanna do it, and, well, I refuse to do it. So when it comes to angled legs like this, my favorite thing to do is just to draw out the leg design on a piece of plywood. I start by drawing a box. This is the exact width I want my legs to be and the exact height I want my legs to be. Then inside that box, well, I just draw out the shape of my leg design. I know I want a little angle coming from the bottom up to the top, so I measure equal distances in on both sides and I draw that angle. Then I want the leg to have a slight taper from the bottom up towards the top. So I measure in again on the bottom and the top until I've got a taper that looks just the way I want it. I measure for my cross piece and what do you know? I've got what? kind of resembles the leg shape I'm going for. Now the joinery at the top is going to be a miter. So I add in where I need to cut for my miter and now I have exactly the size of all three pieces I need to make up these legs. It's just as simple as cutting them to that shape and hooking them together. Well, 
It's almost that simple. First, we gotta figure out how to cut them to the right shape. To do this, I use what any woodworker would use, double-sided tape. Actually, that's probably only what I use because I'm a weirdo. I tape some blocks down along the lines of my leg and the top of my box. This will give me all the angles I need. I slap my actual leg piece in there so it's held firm against those pieces, and using a straight edge, I trace a line along the top. This gives me the exact angle and position I need to cut the top of the leg. Then I do the same thing on the bottom, following that line of plywood, and now I've got a line at the top and a line at the bottom that are the exact right angle. So all I need to do is go over to the chop saw, match that angle with my blade, and slice them down. In no time, I have the beginning of a nice angled tapered leg. Next, I gotta figure out the taper. Well, this is pretty darn easy, because I already measured it out on the piece of plywood. So all I have to do now is transfer those measurements onto the piece itself, get a straight edge, and connect the dots. I mean, it's basically like we're back in first grade making those connect the dots pictures, which never looked like they were supposed to for me. Next, I'm gonna make just a really quick and simple tapering jig. First, I take a piece of plywood and I run it through the table saw to get a nice, clean, straight edge. Then I take some double-sided tape and stick it to that plywood. Then I find that line that I traced onto my walnut stock and I stick my said plywood right on that line using the double-sided tape. Making sure to go slow and get that line dead on. This is gonna be your final cut, so you want it to be perfect. Once it's stuck nice and tight, all you have to do is run that piece of plywood back through the table saw, and what do you know, you're left with the exact shape of the leg you were going for with a beautiful straight taper. Then you can take that leg, make sure it fits by putting it back on your template, everything is looking good, and then use this leg to trace out the shape of all your other legs. I like to use a knife or a razor blade so that I get a really crisp edge I can find over on the miter saw. Then I chop down my other three legs on the miter saw and it's back to the table saw with my trusty thrown together tapering jig to cut three more identical legs. Really, it's not that hard. You just gotta know all the little tricks. With all four of my legs cut and tapered to the right size, it is now time to cut our cross piece. Now you might be saying, I thought you wanted these mitered at the top. Why haven't you cut your miter yet? Well, we actually need the cross piece to get an accurate miter cut, and I'll show you why here in just a second. So once you know the thickness or width of your cross piece, chop that down on the table saw and bring it over and set it on the top of your leg and draw a line at the base of it. Now that you have that line as a reference, you can figure out the exact angle that you need to cut that miter, simply by connecting the dots from the base of that line to the outermost point of your leg. With a nice ruler, you just draw a pencil line. You see, there's the line I need to cut, there's the bottom of my cross piece, and there's all of our waste material. So with that, it's just back over to the chop saw and Boom, we've got a nicely cut miter on the top of that leg. Now that we know that size and angle, I set up a stop block on my miter saw fence and I cut down the remaining three legs to that exact same angle. Then with all of the angles on our legs cut, we have to next find out the angle we need for our cross piece. So I just take a straight ruler, put it against the angle on my leg, have my cross piece lined up where it needs to go and draw a line on the opposite end of the ruler. That gives me the exact angle I need for my cross piece. Then I take it over to the miter saw and I cut my cross piece down with the right angle and the right size and what do you know? Beautiful legs ready to be hooked together. To hook these together, I just mortised out a few little holes with my domino joiner and I'm gonna glue them together with a stacked set of eight millimeter dominoes. But because this is a weird angle, you know me, I love those plywood calls, so I just glue a few on real quick with some CA glue. Now the foreman was at school, so he left his supervisor here during the day to check on my work. She's kind of a pain and likes to get in the way, but you know, she gives good kisses. 
so I can't fault her too much. So with all of my plywood calls firmly glued in place, I started squeezing some more glue and pushing everything together. It was all coming together very nice, and because of these calls, it was super easy to clamp and get nice, even pressure on all of those joints. So a little more smearing glue, a little more applying clamps, and in no time, my legs were all assembled. The next morning, I came back out, and using a hammer, I just knocked off all those plywood calls. Now, you could use a hand sander to clean up all that plywood and CA glue, but why use a hand sander when I've got a drum sander sitting in the corner? So a couple passes on the drum sander and they were clean and ready for step two, which was making the cross pieces to connect both sets of legs. So I cut them down to size over on the chop saw and then I ran them through the table saw giving the top edge a 15 degree angle to match the 15 degree angle on the base of our leg sets, looking something like that. Then back over to my legs, I marked out for my domino joinery, and then I just started drilling holes with the domino joiner. First in the legs, then in the stretchers, and before long, I was ready for a dry fit. Everything was looking exactly like it should, but it was still a bit boxy. It wasn't sexy. It wasn't purdy. So I decided to round the crap out of everything with a half inch roundover bit. Now I could have plopped this in the router table, but it was already chalked up in my trim router. So I just set it on my workbench and went to town. As you can see, this just softens all the edges and makes it look nice and clean. It was a pretty dusty job, so I made sure to wear a mask. Then the last thing I needed to do before we could glue the base together was figure out some sort of way to hook the base to our upper cabinet body. I decided the simple solution was just to drill a few pocket holes on the inside of each rail. This way I could just send some screws directly into the cabinet from underneath and you'll never even know they're there. So with my pocket holes drilled, I was finally ready to glue this entire base together and set it aside and start working on the cabinet itself. So, in no time and a little sped up movie magic, I had my base all glued and we were ready to rock and roll. I use the term ready to rock and roll loosely because we're really not ready for anything. We still got a lot of flipping work to do. And that starts with the upper cabinet portion. While the supervisor looked on, I gave everything a thorough sanding after I removed it from clamps. Then using the track saw, I got a nice straight edge on one end of each of my panels. Once that was cut, I went over to the base and I measured the inside distance from leg to leg. I wanna make these panels just a hair smaller than that inside distance, so that I'll have enough room to set the cabinet inside on top of those legs. With that distance figured out, I clamped both panels together and I cut them to that length at the exact same time. This ensured that both panels would be identical. Once those were cut, it was time to, well, just double check and make sure that I cut everything right. Because sometimes I don't. Sometimes I make it too long or too short. I mean, with me, you never know. Thankfully this time, they were dead on. Perfect fit in between those legs and because I cut them at the same time, they should both fit. Whew, they do, good. Now we gotta start making this thing vertical. Give it some height and give it some storage underneath for our whiskey. That brings us back to what we started this video with, this giant block we clamped up for our end caps. Now that the glue on this was good and dry, I removed it from clamps and I trimmed it down to the exact same width as the panels we just cut down. Because, well, it's gonna be sandwiched in between those panels, so it needs to be the same size. Once it was the same width, I cut a straight edge on one end with the track saw and a straight edge on the other end with the table saw. Now I've got a nice square piece of stock that I can work with. 
Next, I sanded it down so it was nice and smooth. And then it was time to find that rounded profile on the outside. So I stole my son's compass out of his little art kit and I just drew a nice circular radius as big as I could get it on that outside edge. Now you might be wondering, why don't you just round it over with a router bit? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't just have an inch and three quarter round over bit laying around my shop. So get off my back. And it's not that hard to do it by hand anyways. Now you might recognize this technique from my last video. I used the same process to make some rounded drawer pulls. Basically, we start by just removing as much material as we can down to that rounded over line. Doing this with a series of angled cuts on the table saw. You can see I've started working my way towards that line. Then I do a final pass over on the joiner at an extreme angle. That was fun. To bring it even closer to that line. Then I clamp it to my workbench and just by hand with my block plane, I keep going back and forth here and there little bits at a time until I bring it down pretty close to that penciled in line. When we have it pretty close and you're feeling good about it, the final step is to take a super soft pad, slap it on your sander. This soft pad will kind of mimic the profile of the edge and not give you flat spots. And then you just finish the whole thing with the sander. Is it perfect? Well, no, nothing by hand is ever perfect but it's close enough for jazz and woodworking, I guess. So with both ends of our solid stock shaped with a nice rounded profile, I take them over to the table saw and I cut out my two individual end cap pieces. I think the height on these is right around nine and a half inches. As you can see, when you put both pieces together, it's pretty darn close to what we're going for maybe a hair off here or there. So don't always rely on those router bits. Just get your creativity cap on and start shaping things the way you want them. So with those pieces cut and shaped, I put them in place and set the top on just to make sure this was actually looking like a coffee table. The bad news is it looked exactly like a coffee table and we're making a whiskey table, which means we really, really screwed up somewhere. We'll fix it. Do you ever find yourself just dragging throughout the day? You feel tired, you feel like you can't concentrate, you're pounding cups of coffee like it's nobody's business? Well, did you ever think that maybe the solution isn't just pounding more cups of coffee? That's why I am glad to announce that this video is sponsored by Hone Health, something that could actually help. Now you might be asking, what is Hone Health? Well, don't worry, I'm gonna tell you. Did you know that testosterone levels have dropped drastically in our generation? In fact, our father's generation had testosterone levels that were about 25% higher than ours are today. So if you're feeling tired, lethargic, having trouble concentrating, pouring yourself a million cups of coffee a day, there could be something else to blame, and that's low testosterone. But here's the thing, it's not our fault. There's a ton of different things affecting our testosterone levels, environmental changes, generational things. So what do you do about it? Well, Hone sends you this at-home assessment, which makes it super easy to test yourself and find out if low T is something that's affecting you. Let me show you how easy it is. So when you receive your assessment in the mail, it's got everything that you need to test and see whether or not you've got low testosterone. It's got a little finger prick, it's got a return mailing envelope, and this little card. All you do is prick your finger, you dab it on the card, follow the instructions, and send it back. It is really that simple. You get your results, and they'll let you know what you need to do from there. Now here's the thing, I'm not a medical doctor. The only patient I've ever cut into was a solid piece of walnut. But the people at Hone are medical doctors. So once you send your results in, they'll view them, and then they'll set up a video chat between you and an actual medical doctor who will get you on a plan with supplements, medication that will arrive to your door every single month and take care of whatever issue you might have. Who knows, maybe you're fine, but wouldn't you like to know if low T is something that's affecting you? So I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but if I were you, 
I would go to Hone Health and order their easy to use at home assessment. Just find out if this is something you have to worry about or not. It'll give you peace of mind. And as of right now, there's a limited time offer for my viewers where you can get the at home assessment plus a doctor consultation for 45 bucks. You just click the link in the video description or go to honehealth.com slash bourbon moth to take advantage right now. So just down there, click that thing. With our end caps done and shaped, it was time to figure out how to hook the top and bottom and end caps and all that stuff together. So I took it back off the base and plopped the top on the bottom or the bottom on the top. I've lost track at this point. Now I decided just to hook this together with dominoes and glue. Now you might be worried about wood movement, expansion, contraction, that sort of thing, but as you can see the sides are in the exact same alignment as the top and bottom. So this is really no different than doing a mitered waterfall edge. It's just oriented a little bit different with a butt joint instead of a miter joint. So after marking for all my dominoes and mortising out all my holes, I did a dry fit just to make sure everything was nice and flush the way it should be. I was happy to report that it was. So I put the top on and yep, that fit correctly too. Man, I'm on a roll here. Next, we needed to make all the internal dividers for our drawer sections and our glass storage sections. And here's where I switched from solid walnut to walnut veneered plywood. I had this piece of three quarter inch walnut ply that's been sitting in my shop for ages. And I thought, well, this is the perfect project to finally use it. So I cut a piece for the middle divider that was exactly one inch shorter than I needed it to be. That way I could take a piece of half inch solid stock on each end and cover up the plywood with beautiful black walnut. Once I was sure that those face pieces fit nice and snug on my plywood, I smeared on a little glue with my fingy and using these Rockler bandy clamps, I just clamped them in place and set it aside while I waited for the glue to dry. After it was out of clamps, all I had to do was give it a nice sand down and it was crisp and clean and ready to be slid inside our cabinet. And by slid, I mean hooked in firmly with, yep, more dominoes. I realize I'm using a lot of dominoes on this project, but you know what? I just don't care anymore. Get over it. It's a great way to build furniture. So, after carefully marking out where all of my dominoes needed to land and drilling out my mortises, I plopped the dominoes in place and did a dry fit on my middle divider piece. And I'm happy to report that it slid together like a sumo wrestler going down a slip and slide. If that's not a great mental picture, I don't know what is. With our middle divider in place, next we needed to do our other dividers. This is going to separate our drawers from our glass storage. So once again, I had to pull the entire thing apart. There's going to be a lot of that. And taking my end caps over to my dado saw, I carved out a nice three quarter inch dado on opposite ends of each end cap piece. This is going to create a nice channel that I can slide my other dividers into. After doing the end cap, I did the exact same thing to the middle divider I just made on opposite ends. Doing one side, then flipping it over, and yeah, doing the exact same thing on the other side. Now, if you're confused on how this is all going to work, don't worry, I'll show you right now. With all of my dados carved out, I can very easily slide in more three quarter pieces of walnut ply to create all the different compartments and bays that I need for my whiskey and whiskey paraphernalia. With that all pushed together, you guessed it, I put the top back on after I just took it off. Now on the right side of the cabinet, I'm planning a wood drawer to hold all my bottles of whiskey and other spirits. And on the left side, I was thinking glass storage. But you can't just set a glass in there, it's gonna fall out and break on the ground. So I had to come up with some sort of rail to hold the glasses in place. So I just cut down a thin piece of walnut stock and wedged it in there to see if I liked the way it looks. Well, 
I kind of like the way it looks, but it does look a little boxy, if you ask me. And there's always a way to fix that. It's called a quarter inch roundover bit in your trim router. So once again, I rounded the crap out of this piece too, until it looked a lot nicer. Then I plopped my glasses in place just to make sure there was gonna be enough room for those to sit and not be wedged in there. And what do you know, they fit. And there was just enough space in the middle for these coasters. The only problem is the coasters were kind of flopping all over the place. So I needed to figure out some sort of system to make sure those coasters stayed put. So I went over to my scrap bin and pulled out some of the offcuts of my eight quarter piece of walnut I used for the end caps. I cut down a few lengths until I had enough to glue up a nice block of solid walnut. Now you might be really confused. How is this block of solid walnut gonna hold some coasters? Well, when this glue dries up, I promise I will show you exactly how this block will hold some coasters. But while I wait for that glue to dry, I decided to hook my little drink rail thing in place. So back over to the domino joiner, everyone's favorite tool, am I right? I mortised out the ends of each one of my little rail pieces, and I did the same thing to my center divider as well to my end caps. Once all those holes were drilled, the big question was, with all these different dominoes and angles, am I even going to be able to get this whole thing together for glue up? With a little twist in here and finagling there, I managed to get everything in its appropriate spot. If you're wondering, the table's upside down right now, so no, the rails aren't on the wrong side. Just calm down. With that, we were almost ready to glue this whole thing together. But there was one thing I didn't like, and that was this seam right here, where it goes from face grain to end grain. I just hated that transition. I thought it needed something to give it a little separation. I decided on an eighth inch shadow line on the top and bottom. I really thought that would just class up the joint. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, this is an instructional video. Don't worry, I'll show you. I started by just using some double-sided tape to adhere a few little spoiler blocks or waste blocks or sacrificial blocks to all four corners of both end caps. Then I took them over to my router table and using an eighth inch by quarter inch rabbiting bit, I rabbited out a little groove on the top and bottom of both of my end caps. I keep calling them end caps. I don't even know if that's right. Side panels? end pieces. Whatever, I'm sticking with end caps. We've come too far. As you can see, it creates this nice little back cut, which when the entire thing is put together, it looks something like, wait for it, this. A nice eighth inch shadow line at the top and at the bottom. This really helps to make that seam look intentional and not just a seam. While I was busy figuring all that out, my shop assistant, Craig, put some finish on the base. Yeah, that's right. I got a shop assistant now. He started this week, and you'll probably be seeing more of him as the videos progress. He's a pretty cool guy. By this time, my big block of wood I glued together for our coaster problem was dry and ready to be dealt with. So I pulled the whole thing out of clamps and I sent it through the joiner and planer to get a nice smooth surface. Now my plan was to cut a four inch hole in the middle of this block because the coasters are also four inches. But I didn't have a four inch bit that was any good at cutting hardwood. The only thing I had was this hole saw, which isn't exactly the best thing for cutting into hard walnut. But that's never stopped me before, so I chocked it up in the drill press and, um, I coughed and choked on a lot of smoke. The other problem was it only went halfway through, but luckily the pilot bit in the center went all the way through, so it gave me a nice reference once I flipped it over and I just drilled it from both sides until eventually I successfully made it all the way through. With my four inch hole cut in the middle, I went back over to my cabinet and I measured the distance between the glasses to see how much space I had to work with for this little coaster holder. 
Then I went over to the table saw and I cut my block directly in half, giving me two separate coaster holders. See? Fit right in there, nice and tidy. Then I cut it to the right size over on the miter saw. And the last thing I did was add a little back piece to make it the exact same width as the glasses that it was going to sit next to, as well as just bring those coasters off of that back divider a little bit. So a little glue there and a little clamp here. And these things are pretty much done. While I waited for that glue to dry, man, there's a lot of waiting for glue to dry in woodworking. I was finally ready to glue our entire cabinet box together. Now I gotta tell you, with all the dados and dominoes and rails and dividers, this was quite the interesting glue up. But I managed it in the end by going slow and staying confident. That's what my dad always told me when I was riding my bicycle. Which ultimately led to me being attacked by that rabid dog because I was riding so slow I couldn't outrun it. But hey, at least I stayed confident. Anyways, that's a story for another time. After waiting a good hour or so for my glue to dry, I pulled the entire thing out of clamps and I was finally ready to do the thing I had been waiting for ever since I cut those end caps. And that was to round over the top and bottom corners to match the profile of those end pieces. This was pretty darn simple because those end pieces were basically just a router template. So I just clamped on a little spoiler piece on the inside so that I didn't go too far with my router bit. And I followed that curve right on around until, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, dairy. Oh, I'm supposed to say legend and then wait for it and then dairy. Now you guys just think I like milk. Anyways, as you can see, those cleaned up beautifully and really just set the entire thing off. And come on, that shadow line, that was a good choice, right? Looks pretty darn clean. After rounding over the corners on the top side, I flipped it over and did the exact same thing on the bottom side. And in no time, I was done. Not like done, done, but I was done with that one step. While I had the whole thing flipped over, I thought this would be a great opportunity to rub some finish on the bottom. It was the end of the day, and I always like to finish the bottom of a piece last, so that when I come back in the morning, it is dry, and I can flip the whole thing over, just like this, and rub finish on all the other parts. Or you can rub something else, like your new shop assistant. I mean, it's his first day, you don't want to make things too awkward, but because we're in a really soft sweatshirt. Anyways, before I finished the rest of the piece, I needed to glue in place my little coaster holders. So I just used a very light amount of glue and a little CA glue. The CA glue is gonna dry super quick and act as a clamp while the rest of the glue sets up. So I just very carefully slid it in place, used a little triangle to make sure it was nice and square, and Craig ruined the shot by taking the garbage out. Come on, man. With my coaster holders in place, it was time to smear finish on every nook and cranny. Well, not every nook and cranny. There's one spot I didn't put finish on, and that was on the sides right here, because I'm going to be building some wood drawer slides that I want to glue onto that edge. And if I put Rubio on there, well... The glue's not going to stick, so I did not finish that part. We'll do that later. But I did finish the sides and the top. Made that walnut pop in my shop. Won't stop. Huh. That was my rap about finishing. The next day, when the finish was dry, I came out and put all my glasses in place and my coasters. And now it was time to figure out this wooden drawer to hold the whiskey. So I built a wooden drawer to hold the whiskey. Now, if you're like, hold on a moment, you didn't show us how you made that drawer. What the heck, man? Well, this drawer is actually kind of complicated 
and I couldn't fit it in this video. So I'm doing an entire video next week just on this drawer and the wooden slides. So don't worry, I will show you how I did it. You just have to wait till next week. With my drawers constructed, it was time to hook my base onto the cabinet body itself. So I flipped the cabinet upside down and then very carefully slid my base in place. And I was very happy that it fit. Then using my pre-drilled pocket holes, I attached the base to the bottom of the cabinet with a few screws and flipped the whole thing back over by myself with no help from Craig. He might get fired. With it flipped over, I put my drawers in place, installed my drawer faces, and tested to make sure that they worked properly. But I'm not gonna tell you too much about that because I'm gonna save it for the video next week. But rest assured, they worked really well. Then it was time to put all my glasses where they needed to go, put my coasters in their little coaster holder, and of course, my favorite part, start filling this whole thing up with some liquor. Now I know it's technically not ideal to store whiskey or any type of hard alcohol on its side. Supposedly it can eat away the cork and it can change the flavor of the spirit. But rest assured, all the corks in these bottles are synthetic and or twist off tops. And let's be honest, none of my whiskey stays around long enough to hurt a cork. I mean, I drink that stuff pretty fast. I mean, a cork can't dissolve in a day, can it? Then a last minute addition was putting these tap LED lights up underneath the cabinet. I just thought it was a shame that you couldn't see all the alcohol in there. I mean, that's kind of the highlight of the entire piece. So for $11 on Amazon, I got these little tap lights and they just stuck inside with some super strong double sided tape. But what they add to the piece is, well, some light. They, they add some light to the piece. I was going to say something poetic there, but let's be honest. They're just some plastic LED lights. Let's not go too far. Well, there you have it. A whiskey table. Hopefully you enjoyed that video. Hopefully you learned something. Now, make sure you come back next week when I drop the full video on exactly how I did these drawers. Wood drawers, wood slides, all the storage. It's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, I just didn't have enough time to include it all in this video. But I promise next week, I'll tell you exactly how I did every single detail. And I promise also by then, all this whiskey will be in my belly.